Harinder Singh, 21st April 2014. I was 12 years old, almost 12. I was studying, I was in, uh, obviously, this is pre-high school days. Okay. In June 1984, we were part of the Jatha, which had gone to uh, Pakistan for Sikh pilgrimage. And we heard about the uh, 1984 invasion by the Indian Army while in Lahore. Uh, Basically, it was through the Pakistan TV. I remember we were in Lahore at the time. And then we moved on to Nankana Sahib. We heard a little bit more details. Eventually, when it hit home was when we were not allowed to come back into India on the 6th of June, and we were stuck in Lahore because the Indian government wasn't al allowing us to come back to India. And now we know the reasons why. So the whole day we were in Lahore, and that's when we heard more details about it. At the time, you know, it wasn't really uh, hitting us. Uh, because I remember being in Ankana Saab and hearing a little bit, few things about it, and then Lahore, we heard many more details. Obviously, what was whatever was available on Pakistani TV and Pakistani radio, but the reaction uh, became um, sort of more solidified because eventually on June 8th they allowed us to come back, and we were supposed to. We were on a train, which was when we were supposed to get off in Amritsar, and without any announcements, we saw. Basically, the train didn't stop. Uh, we were supposed to get on Amritsar, and while going through the whole of Punjab, the train eventually stopped in Ambala, just so you know the geography, which essentially nowhere in Punjab we were stopped. And while going through Amritsar, it was late evening, almost uh, nighttime. We saw smoke from our train. There were army everywhere next to the train stations and on the tracks pointing stain guns at us, as if we were going to do certain things. The whole of Punjab, there was zero communication to us. So when we, when eventually when we hear about there was, uh, Punjab was blacked out, Punjab was cordoned, those are not just the reports of Amnesty International Media we hear of all the testimonies, but I actually firsthand saw all of those. And that created a very different understanding for us about what really was happening all over Punjab, not just in Amritsar. In November 1984, uh, we were in our house in Jhansi, UP. Um, and uh, I remember actually um, during the daytime, somebody in the market telling me, hey, you know, if I was a Sardar, I would go home because things are about to happen. And in the evening, um, uh, people came and burned our house. There are interesting things here. You know, my grandfather, somebody came to my grandfather's shop in Jhansi, uh, some Sikh officer from Indian Army, uh, about two days before that, he said, things, you know, bad things are about to happen. You guys should really take care of your families. And that's all he said. And um, uh, then we know within this uh, town I live in is, uh, uh, there's a university in town called Bundelkhand University. Uh, the student unions of that university took out a whole parade, you know, talking about how we need to take vengeance of Mrs. Gandhi's assassination. So I heard it about in the market. I heard it about on TV and radio. I remember you know, what now popularly is called Khun Ka Vatla Khun, you know, those kind of slogans. I remember watching them on Doordarshan. Um, so it was, you know, within 48 hours of uh, Mrs. Gandhi's assassination, we heard all sorts of stories. And eventually my grandfather's uh, shop was burned down. My chacha's shop was burned down. My uh, relatives in Delhi, one of them was burned alive. Uh, people who came to burn our house, my, eventually we all woke up. And uh, my dad actually caught one of the guys. Uh, so we have different understandings of what was going on in November 84, uh, in, uh, which included what was being presented by the government on radio and TV, which included how the unions and the local leaderships were doing in Jhansi itself. And it also included the people who were coming to burn our house. That's an interesting phenomenon in itself. I remember people from Arya Samaj coming to our house and holding meetings with my grandfather that how we need to hold a unity march to show how Sikhs are Hindus are brothers. And at, after some meetings, uh, there was understanding, okay, we'll do it. But when the march was brought out, they actually said, not Hindu Sikh, bye bye. They kept saying Hindu, Hindu, bye bye. So that's one angle. And that angle is um, the guy, eventually we learned, you know, the people who were hired, I would say, or sent to burn our house, my dad actually knew most of them. Later we learned it was organized by the Jansangis, which is today's BJP. Uh, so that's our experience there. The third thing which I also want to mention when our house was being burned, 
uh, no, none of the neighbors came to help. You know, we were three of us siblings. We lived in a combined family. My chachas and his families were there. My grandfather and grandmother were there. The only person who came to help was also a Hindu gentleman, about a couple, couple of, uh, not a next door neighbor, but after two houses. Bhagwan Das was his name. And uh, we, in fact, spent the night at his house. And next day, he was uh, roughed up in the market for helping the six. So there are various things going on. Uh, it was, in our case, it was BJP inciting it. Eventually, what did help in our neighborhood was that the DC of our city, Mr. Kashyap, actually sent two policemen to every sick household uh, who end up staying at our house for a long time. I remember not going to school for at least two weeks. And after the policemen were sent to all the houses, after the properties were burned or whatever survived, that's when we found out that none of the, uh, no more killings happened after that or no more burnings and lootings happened. But at the same time, the guy my dog caught, you know, while he walked out and, you know, and that 30 people who came, uh, he actually uh, gave him to police and he knew him. He in fact funded his education. So this was very interesting phenomena going on. These are the people we knew. In some cases, it, you know, we hear about people, we didn't know who they were, they were hired help. In some cases, in our case, we knew who exactly the guys were. He handed him to police, and police let him go two days later. I also remember my dad saying, you know, after those two weeks, when he heard about my Fofford being warned alive in Delhi with the same motorcycle, they dumped out the patrol and burned him. He went to see him two weeks later because he was in railways. He got a place to hide within one of the compartments and go to check out his sister and his family. But he also did one major thing in our case. He ended up going to U.S. Embassy my mama, who had been living in since 60s in America, had been asking us to migrate. Um, but uh, this was the point in our time when my dad said, let me file for immigration because this is not my country anymore. Okay. Only those, we did not apply for political asylums. We came through immigration process, so only those who were allowed or could go through the process did, which basically meant my immediate family. All of my mom's side of the families from Delhi, from Himachal, from Punjab, they all moved. So those who were allowed to the extent of immigration policies at the time in America. So we all end up migrating within two years uh, by, I actually landed in America on July 4th, 1986. Well, you know, I was a very angry, angry young man and uh, I really didn't know how to deal with this for a longest period. I didn't return until 1997. I had to figure out how to channelize my anger, what I had witnessed going through high school, college, masters, working life in America at some point I did decide to go back, and one of the first trips I did was after landing in Delhi, was to go to Jhansi and actually go meet Bhagwan Das, the guy who helped us survive. Uh, and that was an interesting, and that's it, I had nothing else to do in that city. Uh, my parents have gone back, yeah, my siblings have gone back, we have all met the individual and his family. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's an emotional experience for most of us, we wouldn't have been here unless it was for uh, Bhagwan Das and his family. So yes, we have, but it's taken um, channelizing the anger into some constructive uh, forums to figure out how to deal with the trauma of 84, but more importantly, how do you, you know, beyond the politics of it, which obviously needs uh, proper attention as well, there's a human angle to it. And even though we were helped by one individual who happened to be from the Hindu community, the vast uh, majority of uh, majority Hindu community were actually if not directly participating, were in favor of what happened. And that was our experience as well, including the religious leaders of Jhansi and the student leaders and the unions. I do want to mention one more thing, actually. I remember one, uh, the only person who came to our house every single day to ask if we needed bread or milk because none of us were going out was one Muslim guy who used to do tutor for my sister, you know, because she was in high school at the time, he was tutoring her in math. He came every day to ask how we were doing and he would bring us um, the, the, the daily consumables we needed to survive. Didn't until for a long period, you know, since 86 to I would say almost 95, 96, we stayed quiet. We did not discuss it in our home. We didn't know what to do about it. But, you know, going through Amritsar in, at the end of May and then eventually in Pakistan, the June, we had some ideas, you know, how we were checked. So we knew, we went through our own experiences of November and June 84. We didn't talk about it for the longest period until I was in college. And I would say me taking Amrit at a certain point in my life, which basically was towards the end of my high school in Kansas, 
I think it was more preparation. How do you become more fearless? How do you start having dialogues? How do you not talk about hatred and violence in an unnecessary sense, but how do you really look at the state being violent and from a Sikh ideology uh, equip ourselves to talk about these issues? No nightmares, no flashbacks, but uh, I think um, it definitely defined who I am. It definitely defined what I ended up doing with my life and, in, 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 in fact, my family's life as well to a certain extent. So it definitely uh, uh, was a transformational experience and at some point in our lives, post-college, it ended up defining what we do, do in our lives. Well, since then, I've had a chance to actually go interview the army brats regarding June and meet some of the generals. Uh, had spent five years in Punjab, have studied about why these things happened in our Sikh history in the earlier Kalugara tradition. So, you know, now we know a little bit more about what happened and how it was conducted from voter registration list to pre-planning 14 to 16 months in advance. So all those informations are now widely available and the role of not just British government, but also even American government, who was really supplying these night goggle visions. You know, those are the kind of questions we are still not raising. But the why part is really tough to answer. The only thing I have come so far in my life to figure this out is, it really has to do with who Sikhs are by very principle, what our doctrine is, and why we continue to remain the people who challenge the powers to be, whether they're religious powers or political powers. And I think this has a lot to do with it. You know, the, the relationship between the Sikhs and the Indian states since 1947, and specifically in, you know, post-emergency in Mrs. Gandhi's case. But this is not really about Congress or Jan Sang or BJP. It really is about whoever the powers, whether they were Middle Easterners or Europeans or homegrown Indians, whoever the powers have been, we have taken them to task. And I think this is one reason um, we go through genocidal campaigns. Uh, we went through another genocidal campaign, you know, in post-84. Uh, we went through genocidal campaigns in 18th century several times. So I think this really comes down to if we remain being a Sikh, which essentially is about uh, establishing economic and political policies and rights for those who are disenfranchised, we will continue to go through these things. 1984 is not just, uh, you know, when people talk about 1984, Sikh community itself, as well as the non-Sikh community, we keep, you know, asking questions. There are Holocaust deniers, for example. So since, since similarly, we have 1984 deniers. People keep blaming their own community, some of the members in the community, or a particular parties of power in Congress or other ways. But really, you know, when you have gone through experiences like this, you look at the human angle more. And at some point, you transcend that human angle, you look at the political angles to it. Because there are institutions, there are governments who do have regressive policies throughout the world. India has its share as well, you know, whether you look at it in Assam and Kashmir and Punjab and Tamils, Odisha, other places as well. Uh, this really uh, ended up changing the way, my worldview essentially. So Sikhi, I looked at Sikhi at some point in my life as something I want to learn from, which defined my worldview. My experiences of 84 end up defining that I'm not really here to prove or disprove what happened in 84, but rather how do I make sure these kind of sentiments are properly narrated within the Sikh context and the larger Indian context, because there are you know, 1.2 billion Indians in, in the world right now. And uh, they have a huge task ahead of them. This is election year as well, you know, where they're trying to decide whether a Hitler-like genocide campaigner should become a PM. And because people in India did not deal with Sikh issue properly or Kashmiri issues properly or Assami issues or women issues or Dalit issues, we continue to have these genocidal campaigns. At some point, average Indian has to really think about do they want to be identified as, you know, uh, genocidal communities of the world or really rethink who they should be electing and what kind of institution they be shutting up, not just with Sikhs, but other minorities to change the realities of India. Uh, whenever the Vadda Kalukara happened or the Chota Kalukara happened, uh, we never really complained about what happened. Something drastically has changed in the last 30 years that we continue to get into this victimhood, that we have been killed, we have been hunted, but that's our history. We remember this in Ardas every day. Uh, we should really think about what a response needs to be. Like Guru Arjan was also hunted. Guru Tegh Bahadur was being killed by hiring Shiha, a hitman to kill him. Our forefathers and foremothers in Meer Mandu's prison went through this, and so did they did in British prisons. Now we go through this in Indian prisons. 
it is a continuous saga, but we never said, why are you doing this to us? We used to say, it's okay, do your job and we'll continue to do ours. So we need to really have an open, genuine discourse about how to look at 84 within the Sikh narrative and not look at it from an Indian or other genocidal campaigns only. That's one thing I think we should definitely have a discourse on. The second thing is we've always been futuristic. Guru Granth Sahib talks about which basically means, you know, what do we do about it next? When Jassa Singh Aluwalia went through this, you know, he captured Sarhand and Lahore and Amritsar within 18 months. So we have our own responses to these things. Nomadi needs to go look at, you know, this is the 30th anniversary. In the next 30 years, what we should be doing. When 2084 comes, by the time 100 years come, people will be asking, my grandchildren will be asking, what did you do? And that's the kind of discourse we need to get into not just what they did, because governments do this all over the world. Uh, yes, we need to have much better documentation of this. Yes, we need to provide sick narratives for it. And yes, we need to also you leverage what happened in 84 to really look into sick worldview to define what kind of a diasporic community we want to be and what kind of relationship we must have with Punjab, because some of those issues remain unresolved.